Hello and welcome. You found the Social Work Podcast. My name is Jonathan Singer, and I'll be your host as we explore all things social work. Hey there, podcast listeners. Jonathan here. I'm so excited about today's episode. You know, one of the things that's most challenging in the world of mental health services that includes talk therapy and case management and medication and all sorts of things that we have out there to help folks uh, do better in their lives. One of the biggest challenges is engagement. You know, the modal number of sessions that somebody attends is one. That means if you look at all of the sessions that people attend on all the people that attend sessions, that the most number of people only attend one session. Now, one session might be great if you have a very discreet, um, slight problem that you need a little bit of help with to keep going. One session is really problematic if you've got some deep-seated issues that have been problematic in your life for a long time, or if they're life-threatening, such as in the case of folks who are suicidal. I'm really excited about today's guest, Dr. Dana Alonzo, because Treatment engagement for folks who are suicidal, that's her wheelhouse. This is her area of expertise. And one of the things that she learned in her research is that clinicians saw that success in treatment was because of what they were doing. But if the treatment wasn't successful, they blamed it on their clients. Now, this is a huge problem. And this means that clinicians, not all clinicians, obviously, I'm not talking about you, but, you know, maybe your colleagues, that instead of thinking about, well, what can I do to engage this person in treatment, to keep the treatment going, that there's an attitude that, well, if treatment goes well, it's because I'm doing well, the therapist, and if it doesn't go well, it's because my client did something wrong. Now, if you're suicidal, you're already thinking that you're doing things wrong. You're already thinking that life isn't working well for you. And if you have a clinician that thinks, well, if they don't want to come back, that's their deal, then that's problematic for the client and their likelihood of living on multiple levels. So I, 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 I wanted to talk with Dana about her work in treatment engagement. Now, Dana Alonzo, uh, she received her Ph.D. from Fordham University's Graduate School of Social Service, where she was awarded a National Institute of Mental Health Research Training Fellowship. As the co-investigator at the Developing Centers for Interventions for the Prevention of Suicide at New York State Psychiatric Institute, she conducted studies examining risk and protective factors across cultures related to mood disorders and suicidal behavior. Now, she's been funded by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the National Alliance for Research on Schizophrenia and Depression, and a couple of organizations in New York State. And her research has focused on the development of novel interventions aimed at improving treatment engagement and adherence among suicide attempters. Dr. Alonzo founded the Suicide Prevention Research Program at Fordham University's Graduate School of Social Service. Dana is the co-author, along with Robin Gearing, of the Springer text, Suicide Assessment and Treatment, Empirical and Evidence-Based Practices. And you can find that uh, from our website or just Google Dana Alonzo and Suicide, and I'm sure you'll find it. In today's episode, Dana and I talk about engaging folks at risk for suicide in mental health services. She starts out by explaining kind of a classic cognitive behavioral perspective for why folks in a suicidal crisis might find it challenging to seek help. We then sort of flip that around and we talk about some of the barriers, the systemic barriers to help seeking. This includes clinicians' attitudes towards clients who are suicidal, availability of treatments, um, training of graduate level professionals. And, and we go on to talk about some of the things that people can do to engage folks who are suicidal or really anyone who's seeking mental health services. So I hope that you really enjoy this episode and that you get something out of it, whether you're working with a suicidal client right now or not, because one of the things that's true about mental health is that, um, you've either worked with folks who are suicidal or you've not yet worked with folks who are suicidal. 
Now, the links to some of the things that we talked about in the show are on socialworkpodcast.com. If you want to follow Social Work Podcast on Twitter, just go to at S-O-C-W-O-R-K podcast or the Facebook page where you can connect with a community of folks over 14,000 strong at facebook.com forward slash SW podcast. And one of the ways you can support the podcast is by filling out our survey. There's a link on the podcast website. Or if you're on iTunes, go on to iTunes and give us a five-star rating and tell everybody what you think about the podcast. I mean, hopefully good stuff. The more five-star ratings and the more reviews, the easier it is for folks that have never heard of the podcast to hear it and hear what we do. And now, without further ado, on to episode 111 of the Social Work Podcast, Engaging People at Risk for Suicide, an interview with Dr. Dana Alonzo. All right, Dana, thank you so much for being here on the Social Work Podcast and talking with us about engagement and folks at risk for suicide. Thanks for having me. So you and I both do suicide prevention research. We're, that's that's our area. And one of the great things about the last 20 years is seeing that there are all of these treatments that have been developed that have actually been shown to reduce suicide risk for folks. Um, but you, so interesting, you focus on this thing that happens right before, right? It addresses this issue of, of, of uh, engagement. Can you talk about that? Right. So one of the things we know is that an evidence-based practice can only be as effective as the patients who are there to receive it. And unfortunately, for this very highly vulnerable group of individuals at risk for suicide, we know that they just don't go to mental health treatment at the rate that would be helpful to mitigate their risk. Um, and I think there are a number of reasons why that is. And I think one thing that research has shown us so far is that uh, individuals at risk for suicide tend to engage in a series of cognitive distortions that impact the way they experience themselves in relationship to others in the world. Right? And they tend to interpret um, experiences in, in a negative way. And these kinds of repeated negative experiences over time can lead to difficulty with uh, managing emotion, with uh, maintaining interpersonal relationships, and tend to lead to a lack of expectation for positive experiences in the future. Um, we also know that these kinds of cognitive distortions impact the way individuals at risk for suicide engage in decision-making processes. Right? So um, there are several different stages that are involved in making a decision, coming up with an effective solution, and individuals at risk for suicide um, tend to get stuck in that process at a, ver at a bunch of different points. Um, the first is that it's really hard for them to identify an accurate trigger for their distress. So they're searching for cues in the environment. And because they tend to uh, engage in these cognitive distortions that I mentioned earlier, they have a very hard time figuring out what the correct trigger is. Right? So if they can overcome that hurdle and actually identify the correct problem, they can move along. Right? And then they tend to get stuck with identifying a possible solution. Right? And they get overwhelmed in that process and either have trouble generating any kind of solution at all or generate a bunch of solutions and then get stuck trying to figure out which one is the best. Um, or they come up with a great solution and they try to put that into action. And because they've identified the wrong trigger, what they find is that their attempt is unsuccessful to, right, and they can't resolve their problems. And this feeds into that whole lack of positive expectations about the future. So there are all these ways that they're thinking about what's going on with them and sort of the people around them that doesn't sort of match reality. Absolutely. And then there's this process about like, what's the problem and how can I solve it? And it's really complicated. That's absolutely correct. So this sounds like this is all on the suicidal person, like that it's not about our system of care, which we know is really problematic. Like where does that all tie into this. Right, absolutely. So assuming the individual is able to kind of overcome all of those hurdles we just talked about and actually decide that treatment might, might be an option for them and in the face of really low expectations for success, they still say, I'm going to give it a try. Um, Which is amazing. Right, absolutely. <laughs> right, and, and it happens, right? So it's, and it's important to recognize that as a, a really, it's a really important strength in this group of individuals that they risk make putting themselves out there and making themselves vulnerable for something that they really think isn't going to help anyway. Um, but once they get to treatment, what we know is um, that providers, clinicians, tend to have 
a really strong reaction to individuals presenting with suicidal ideation. And what research shows is that um, clinicians tend to experience a, a greater level of fear working with clients who have suicidality as part of their presenting problem. They tend to use their nonverbal behavior in a more negative and judgmental way. So even when they're able to contain themselves from making judgmental statements about why would you do that? This is, you know, there are other ways. We're going to work on this and figure out better ways, which they think might be supportive. What their nonverbal behavior is is expressing is judgment in some way or um, dislike or disapproval. Research has shown us that clinicians tend to uh, view clients who experience suicidality as less likable and more blameworthy for their problems. Um, So, Combined, when you think about the individual struggling with these problems, they've overcome the hurdle of identifying the right trigger. They've figured out a bunch of solutions and tried, and it didn't work. They still managed to get themselves to treatment, and then they present for treatment, and they find a clinician who is um, judging them at best and fearful of them at worst, right? Oh, my God. That sounds, that sounds awful. Right. Absolutely. And then the expectation is that they'll say, oh, but that's okay. I'll keep going. Right. Like after all of these things, the person who, you know, maybe even like four hours earlier was thinking, I'm going to kill myself and is now in front of a clinician has to then overcome all the clinician's issues as well as their own. (laughs) Absolutely. And it's reasonable, actually, that the clinician might feel fearful or might not know what to do when the client presents this way because the majority of direct practitioners in the United States are social workers, like over 65 percent at this point. Um, So most likely when someone who's suicidal goes for outpatient treatment, they're going to see a social worker. Um, And most social work programs don't provide training in suicide assessment and treatment. And when training is provided, the average amount is two hours. Right, which is terrible. And so you're saying it's reasonable to expect not because it's actually okay, acceptable. it's not acceptable, no. but it's given the, the, the poor level of training in social work as well as psychology and other programs, it, that's kind of where we are, which, which is problematic. And I know that you teach a class and we won't get into all right. of that, but you, so you're doing something actively to address that. And there's some other folks around the country. So, right. um, What's not reasonable is that we expect that the client says, oh, well, I know the person might not have received much training in this and so I'll bear with it and see if it gets better, right? Like that's ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, so. yeah. That is okay. So, um, uh, given that there's not the level of education and training that there needs to be, um, w- what do we do? Right. So, I mean, a couple of things. I think one of the things I've tried to spend time understanding is from the client's perspective, what is it that makes it difficult for them to engage in treatment? And so we've heard this kind of stuff, right? It's the kind of, um, um, it's difficult to form a a trusting relationship with my clinician because I feel like they're judging me or I feel like they just don't understand how I arrived at the point where this was my option. Um, But I've also spent some time talking to clinicians who work with high-risk clients and identifying from the clinician's perspective, what are the barriers to and facilitators of treatment engagement of suicidal clients Um, to see, I mean, one of the things that's important to know is do our perceptions match with what our clients' perceptions are? And oftentimes we find that they don't, right? And we're making a lot of assumptions. And what was most surprising to me about this study that I conducted um, doing in-depth focus groups with clinicians who are in New York City in the tri-state area working with in an outpatient, large outpatient mental health centers and identified as working with uh, high-risk clients was that um, if they felt engaged in the process, then by default the client would. And it did not acknowledge what the client's experience might be at all. But when it came to identifying barriers to treatment, client insight into their illness was the number one barrier identified. Right? So clients are fully responsible for why they don't engage, and clinicians are fully f- responsible when it's going well. So, so wait, it, is it reasonable to say that that's very much like a pass the buck kind of response on the part of the clinicians? Right. Well, it, to me, it certainly feels that way. It yeah. feels like the suggestion is that I do you know, everything I can and should. And when it doesn't go right, I don't need to look at myself and say, do I really do everything I can and should, right? Because instead I say, well, obviously it's because the client isn't doing their part. <laughs> That's, which is particularly problematic when you're talking with folks who are ambivalent about living absolutely. in the first place. <laughs> That's absolutely. <laughs> okay, so so when you said that the, the, the social workers felt engaged – 
What did you mean? What What do you mean by engagement? So I think that's actually a really interesting question, and it was the question that I had for those clinicians. So define what it means when you're engaged with these clients. And what I hear varies certainly across clinicians, but I get a lot of I feel connected to them emotionally in some way. I feel like I can understand their experience in some way. Um, I feel like we have a connection that, that's based on trust where we, you know, the client tells me things that they might not feel comfortable telling someone else. It sounds like uh, like therapeutic alliance, rapport, like those sorts of things. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, when I think of engagement and I think of my work I've done in, in interventions and how I measure engagement, I'm interested more than just the kind of physical presence in the room, right? That's one piece is you have to be there to be engaged. So do you show up for your first session? How many sessions do you show up afterwards? But the psychological component as well, right? And so how connected to your worker do you feel on the flip side? How satisfied are you with the care that you're receiving? How well do you feel like the care that you're getting is moving you towards your goals? Okay, so you've developed an intervention that addresses this issue of engagement. So, so what do you do in the intervention? Right. So let me first tell you a little bit about where the intervention came from. Okay. Um, and one of the things you can imagine is that oftentimes the clinician's perceptions about the level of engagement vary greatly from the client's. Right? Um, and this is something that I, that I looked at early on and um, did some research in a large urban psychiatric emergency room in New York City uh, and spoke with people who were presenting at the emergency room for either severe suicidal ideation or post-suicide attempt. And we talked about issues related to um, mental health treatment utilization and their experience in the emergency room and the likelihood that they were going to follow up with the treatment that had been recommended. Um, And one of the things that I would hear time and time again from patients is that how de- is how depersonalized the experience of seeking help was for them, okay. and that while clinicians might think they're doing a really good job with asking all of the questions they need to ask to do an accurate risk assessment, right? Like, are you having suicidal thoughts? Do you have a plan? How often do you have these thoughts? How long do they last, right? And the whole checklist of things so that they can walk away feeling like, great, we had a great conversation. I have a clear sense that pers- this person is at risk or not at risk, and my job here, my work here is done, yeah. right? What clients were feeling, in at least in the emergency room, was – they're just asking me the same questions they ask everybody else, and I am not a person to this worker. Right, right. right. The worker is trying to check off boxes and say, we've established a level of risk. Now we can sort of pass along this person to the next person or something like that. Exactly. And then not only did the doctor do that, but then the nurse did that, and then the uh, the resident did that, and then the resident came back with their attending, and they did that again together. And so, right, so, multi- so like multiple. Right, multiple. Uh, interactions that were never meaningful as far as the client was concerned were the most important and thing that from the clinician's perspective. Right? So there's this mis- mismatch here. Um, the other thing that I learned from the emergency room is that there was this perception, at least at the time when I was doing the study, um, that ERs tend to be the first point of contact for individuals at risk of suicide, that they tend to be out in the community, not utilizing services, and they end up in a suicidal crisis and go to the emergency room and finally get help that way. And the majority of individuals in my study had actually attempted to start outpatient treatment in the year prior to their ER visit. And something happened in that outpatient experience that was not satisfying for them or didn't work for them, and they dropped out. Then they were in the community, struggling, not knowing what to do, having like all those things in the beginning, having a hard time figuring out what their trigger is, what else should I do? I've already tried treatment, and of course it doesn't work for me, and these lack of positive expectations, so they don't go back, right? And now they're out in the community and really do have nowhere else to go, and then end up in the ER. Got it. So so they went through that problem-solving thing you were talking about in the beginning. Exactly. And it, they couldn't successfully resolve it. And so then it, they, they found themselves in the ER right. somehow. Exactly. And so one of the things we realized was we have an opportunity to not only reduce the um, over-reliance on emergency rooms, which we had been seeing increasing in this population, but also unnecessary inpatient psychiatric hospitalizations, which tend to be the default discharge mode from an emergency room as soon as the word suicide is said, right? So, oh, they're here for suicide. We'll just send them to the inpatient psych unit. And inpatient psychiatric hospital stays are 
not only financially burdensome, but psychologically burdensome and can be extremely distressing. And when risk is not at a level that actually needs that, what it does is send the message to the client, don't tell anyone you're having these thoughts because you're going to end up admitted to the hospital, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I know that in my research with kids, one of the things that's come up is that um, kids who were really at low risk and maybe hadn't really uh, thought a lot about suicide found themselves in a closed environment with kids that knew a lot about suicide. And so there was really this sort of like transmission of knowledge around suicide risk that uh, put put these low-risk kids at higher risk. Right. Absolutely. And then you find that the rate of engagement in treatment following discharge from an inpatient unit for suicidality is extremely low. Right. Not surprisingly, right, oftentimes that inpatient hospitalization could have been avoided and people were just sent that message, don't talk about this, right? You're just going to end up right back there. So research shows something like um, within three months after um, an inpatient hospital stay for suicidality, 38% of individuals will no longer be in treatment, right? And three months is the highest risk period for a repeat attempt. So most people who are at great risk are not getting the needed treatment, and that's a problem, right? So um, from that study, I developed an intervention during intake appointments at an outpatient mental health clinic to help bolster the engagement and treatment in outpatient mental health services. As you're talking about this, I'm getting this picture of a bunch of little circles and like an arrow, right? It's this idea like, okay, so you have one circle is like folks in the community right? Folks who are suicidal. And then you've got the providers in the community and there's just like interaction with them that doesn't work. Um, and then sort of time goes on and sort of the, the suicidal uh, client moves out of the outpatient circle and then they're just kind of floating. And then there's the inpatient circle, right? ER, inpatient, they sort of float into that. Um, and it's all along this timeline. And I, and I know that this stuff isn't linear, yeah. Right. And it, it makes it easier to draw, but it's not exactly linear. Um, is, is that your conceptualization of how this works? And if so, like, where does your intervention come in? Right. So I've spent a lot of time trying to understand the sort of suicide prevention process as it as it looks currently, um, or has looked traditionally, rather. And what you tend to see is a lot of research in the area of risk assessment. So we've developed a lot of standardized measures that are now shown to be valid and reliable at assessing for various um, characteristics of suicide risk, like um, either degree of ideation or degree of intent or even reasons for living or wish to live, wish to die, right? So there's a lot of research around this. We also have seen, as you mentioned earlier on, um, the development of evidence-based practices to address suicidal behavior. And so there's a big you know, chunk of research in the field of suicidology focused on intervention development for addressing suicidal behavior. Um, and then there's a lot of research that looks at um, disposition planning, things we can do when people are being discharged from care to equip them with skills to help reduce risk of suicide, like safety planning, for example, right? So um, like a concrete tool we can provide that can help the client to conceptualize what to do when they're in the crisis to avoid acting on suicidal behavior. But nowhere in that process is there a real recognition of the fact that clients are not utilizing services. And so if they don't go, you can't do a great risk assessment and you can't provide an evidence-based practice. Or if they show up in the emergency room, right, you can do a great risk assessment and then you lose them on the treatment and you can't provide the practice. So somewhere they're getting lost. And that's where I ended up with the treatment engagement piece. Um, because uh, what I recognize is that, you know, despite advancements in psychopharmacological treatments for the disorders most often associated with suicide, like depression and um, bipolar disorder, despite the development of all these new EBPs to address suicidal behavior, um, and lots of money being poured into public awareness campaigns to bring the issue of suicide out to the public and try to reduce stigma. Um, I mean, you can... In, in New York, for example, in Washington Heights, on the sides of buses, you'll see in Spanish, Estás right? are you depressed? Are you having thoughts of suicide? Right? Lots of things to bring awareness of suicide to the community. And we've had very little success at reducing the suicide rate in the U.S. overall. And in fact, it's increased now. Yeah. So we have all these great advancements and no impact. And for me, the answer is we're not getting the people who need these like advanced, the results of our 
gained knowledge to the treatments, right? So that's where my, my focus on uh, treatment engagement comes in. And it kind of shifts the suicide prevention process a little bit to pay attention to this earlier stage. So, so tell us about this engagement intervention. Like, what are you doing to address this, this huge gap in, in, in the prevention timeline research framework? Sure. In the intervention, um, there's a combination of brief motivational interviewing and personalized feedback on an individualized risk assessment that was developed for the intervention that consists of evidence-based risk and protective factors for suicide. Okay, so brief motivational interviewing and personalized feedback. Like, what does that actually look like in in the room? Right, absolutely. So if you imagine our suicidal client coming in with that um, combination of cognitive distortions and low expectations and low motivation and uh, uncertain about whether this is really going to actually be effective for them. One of the first things that the intervention does is engage the client in a conversation about what have prior treatment experiences been like for you, right? That way I have a sense of, uh, as the clinician, of what works for this person and what didn't work, right? Because I want to certainly make sure I don't do those things again, right? Um, We then talk about, well, what are your expectations for treatment this time? You've had these experiences in the past. They weren't so great for you or they worked then, but now, you know, whatever you learned then is no longer helpful. What what are you hoping to get out of treatment now? And then we move to um, the personalized risk assessment portion of the intervention. And the suicide risk profile is, as I mentioned, a list of known risk factors and protective factors related to suicidal behavior. And the clinician and the client engage in a conversation about which of these factors are present in the client's life. Right? It really individual individualizes the process of risk assessment because no one, no two people are going to have the same risk profile. And even if the same factors are present, they're not going to be Um, affecting the individual in the same way. So the individual really has the opportunity to tell their story. You know, this really resonates with me, this idea of social isolation, and here's why. And they have the opportunity to explain their situation to the clinician. Um, And the risk factors are presented not in a way of, wow, you meet, you know, 13 of 17 risk factors, you're doomed to engage in suicide. It's really bad. Right, exactly. (laughs) Um, The conversation is always linked to and how treatment can help to mitigate that risk, right? So here's something you've been struggling with. You've tried on your own to figure out what to do about it, and it hasn't worked so well. Let's talk about how treatment can help you address this factor. So if you were to actually go to your appointments, this is the way that this risk factor would be addressed, right? Um, And then at the end of the risk profile, um, the client and the clinician engage in a conversation about, so what are your thoughts about treatment now? Has it changed at all when you, now that you've heard, thought about, you know, seen kind of the constellation of risk factors that are present and have thought and have had a chance to hear how treatment can be helpful at addressing these um, these issues that you're struggling with? Has, does it change at all your ideas about how important treatment is for you and how likely you are to attend your sessions, right? Um, and then they... Uh, discuss, you know, when would be a good time to take this risk profile out? Right? You're going to get a copy of it moving forward. You know, when might you take it out? Right? And during those times when you feel like, I just don't want to go to session today. I just, I just can't get it together, right? Or, you know, my clinician did something last week that I really didn't appreciate, said something that was hurtful or didn't seem to get what I was trying to say and it was really frustrating and I don't, you know, I'm not going to bother, right? Those are the times when you want to take out the risk profile and remember how important treatment was for you in this moment and use it to at least call your clinician and say, you know, this is what I'm feeling and I'm not even wanting to come in today and give them an opportunity to talk about that with you. So that, it's interesting because you're talking about the risk profile, which I think most of us think about it really is this like should I hospitalize and, you know, all that sort of stuff. But you're actually talking about it as a tool for motivating the person to uh, engage, re-engage, address this, to to stay participating in this process. Right. And so it's not a tool for assessing level of risk, low, moderate, severe. It's not the standard, you know, how often do you think about it and for how long? And does this person have the capacity to act, right? It's um, really an assessment of the individual's Again, if you think about it from a social work perspective and doing an eco map, right? Like, what are the the resources that the client has, both internal and external, to help get them through a suicidal crisis? And does the individual see how treatment can be helpful at addressing each of those things? Mm-hmm. Right? And the and the and the goal is not to end up with an idea of how how strong their risk is, but um, how important treatment is. 
That's that's really, and I love the uh, the visual of the eco map because you have the client, and then you have all of these. Again, I love circles. Clearly, you have all, <laughs> <laughs> you have all these circles surrounding the client, and it's like so. This is your connection to this system, or this is like you know work and treatment and medication and whatever it all it all is. And it's like, what is your relationship to those? Right. And instead of being like. Well, that's not going to happen. It's like well, let's talk about what would benefit from like how could you do this again, right? And or what systems are missing, or which are underutilized, or which are not even recognized as as important or as a resource that could actually be utilized, right? Mm -hmm. And then the last piece of the intervention, taking from what we learned about what seemed to possibly be effective in prior studies, is there's um, a follow up phone contact with the client, very brief maintaining the spirit of motivational interviewing again to ask the client, are you attending your sessions? If yes, how'd you do that? Do more of it, right? And if not, it's not a call where you're going to problem solve barriers and solve these problems with the client. But do you think that you can call your clinician and let them know what's been getting in the way and give them an opportunity to help talk you through that and get you back in treatment? Because the goal, again, is not to reduce the suicidal behavior. It's to get the client to the treatment that will do that, right? And so it's constantly making that connection to the importance of treatment and trying to support the, the um, engagement in services. So this has been really, I appreciate you talking about this with regards to suicidal um, folks and, and, and sort of where all this fits into mm -hmm. the suicide prevention framework. Um, in your research and in your you know, clinical experience, are there things that you have learned about engagement in general and like engaging clients that you think are just good general tips for folks to take away whether or not their client is suicidal? Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think first and foremost, the idea of the check-in with your client is something that's, I think, often uh, forgotten. Right? I think there's an assumption that if I'm feeling like this is working, then it's probably working, and oftentimes that that's not true. And so what does a check-in look like? Like if I'm a client, like what would you do to check in with me? Right. So I, I think actually session by session feedback is extremely important. I wouldn't let a week go by without you know saying to my clients at the end of the session, how was this for you? Right. What stands out for you today? Is there anything on your mind that I didn't get to? Anything you feel like you're being left with that, you know? Mm -hmm. we, we need to address before you leave today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it can be as simple as that. Yeah. I think session by session is great. Absolutely. Yeah. Is there anything else? I think that um, it's really important to acknowledge um, when the client has shared with you something that isn't working for them or hasn't worked with them, that you're mindful of that and uh, attentive to it, right? Because there's, there's a reason, right? And if the client has taken the risk to share with you, that this hasn't worked and this isn't working, then it's important to try to understand why and make sure you don't keep doing that, right? So using that feedback in a, in a meaningful way. Yeah, it's such a <laughs> – so there have been times where I've been in therapy, right, as the client, mm -hmm. and I've said, you know, it doesn't really work for me when people agree with me a lot. <laughs> I get a lot of people agree with me in my life. I, I need somebody to, like, challenge me or to call bullshit on what I'm doing, right? right? And and I it, – and, and then, and then the therapist just continues to agree with me. I'm like, it's so disconnecting, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Right. And I think that um, it's not feedback for the sake of feedback. It's not, I now give you the opportunity, and so you've shared, so I've done my job. But what do you do with what you hear, right? And you really have to be willing to hear it and then do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. So these, these all sound like things that are pretty um, – accessible. Like if you're a if you're a social worker and you've been trained, lots of folks have been trained in motivational interviewing, they know the basic concepts, right? And and even if folks haven't gotten a lot of great training on suicide risk assessment, this idea of risk and protective factors is something that we talk about. Yeah. And so if people wanted to get uh, trained in your specific intervention, where would they go? How would they do that? Sure. So the intervention has been manualized and we have some great um, data in terms of feasibility and acceptability and are working on effectiveness uh, research right now. So anyone interested can contact me for more information. That's great. That's great. All right. Dana, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us about your research and about these thoughts about engagement, particularly with folks who are suicidal. I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, this is absolutely terrible. <laughs> <laughs> that was totally disconnecting and I feel unengaged completely <laughs> and cut what? <laughs> and cut <laughs>
Okay, that was a totally ridiculous ending. Um, and Dana is amazing, as you can tell. Now, I'm posting this on the first day of National Suicide Prevention Week in 2017. And one of the amazing set of resources that is available for folks who might not be engaged with services in person, or they might be engaged with services in person, is the crisis lines that we have. And I want to let everybody know what those are. So National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 800-273-8255. There's the Trans Lifeline. 877-565-8860 or the Trevor Project at 866-488-7386. Now, a bunch of these also have uh, web-based and text options. There is a dedicated text line, crisis text line, which is phenomenal. Um, it is the crisis text line, and that's the, the number is 741741. So what you do is you text the word START to 741741 and somebody will respond via text. There's also the Lifeline Crisis Chat, which is www.crisischat.org. Thanks so much for all of your hard work. And if you or someone you know is in a suicidal crisis, please engage these services. I'm Jonathan Singer, and thanks for being with me today for another episode of the Social Work Podcast. If you missed an episode or have suggestions for future episodes, please visit socialworkpodcast.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit our online store at cafepress.com slash swpodcast. To all the social workers out there, keep up the good work. We'll see you next time at the Social Work Podcast.